joke to put him on the spot for time to go, right? <laughs> I wouldn't have done it if I didn't go home. <laughs> Some things you can get away with, right? Okay, so as you know, we meet here uh, every year, and, and we always have actually a really good time being here. So here we are again, and thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. This is probably one of the uh, most informative meetings anyone in this community and surrounding boundary area could ever attend. And we are very pleased with the participation we get with the province uh, with regard to this meeting because if we didn't have that participation, you wouldn't be able to hear from the people you need to hear from. So I start out thanking you, first of all, for filling the seats here and being interested in what goes on at Christine Lake and to Brenda LaCroix. And Brenda, as most of you know, is uh, she's going to do a presentation and she's the coordinator for the Christina Lake Stewardship. So, uh, Brenda, I like to say, is the Christina Lake Stewardship, but I'll tell you what, could the directors of the Stewardship that are here please stand up? Because they do phenomenal work. Peter's the president right now. Really. It's you know, the, the work that's done on that lake is because of those individuals that just stood up. And uh, they're the kind of volunteers that never say no to anything. That's how Christina Lake functions as well as they do. So I'm not going to do a lot more preamble. What I'm going to do is turn this over to Brenda. Please be very kind to her. She's not feeling very well today. So we're sitting her kind of in a corner. She will remain seated while she does her presentation. She will not use the microphone because the rest of you will be using that to answer questions. And I will walk around uh, when you have a question to make sure everyone can hear you. Okay? So Brenda, please. Uh, would you do a presentation for us? And if you really don't feel well, just tell them, just to ask you questions that make you feel worse. <laughs> Help me welcome Brenda LaCroix. Uh, hi, I'm, that's like, I hope I talk loud enough. Um, welcome to the annual watershed review. And this is just a few of the pictures of uh, Jenny Coles Hill's that Vivian crossing the chorus frog. Oh, the lights, yeah. We can see what's going here. And uh, the bear on the couch. We, I was going to put a Budweiser beer in his hand because he looks like a guy sitting on the couch. <laughs> and that was uh, that set series of pictures kind of went viral on the internet. But uh, that was taken by a supervisor to the Ministry of Transportation. <laughs> And the other end is North Bay and three otters that uh, live down at that end. Okay. <coughs> I'm going to do the preamble that everybody's seen that has come to this every year, but it's just a reminder of why we're here. Um, the Christina Lake Watershed Management Plan is put together over a two and a half year process. And surveys were done and committees were talked to and the meetings were every three months over that period of time. And as you know, we review it annually. And the major categories that came up in the watershed plan is water quality, non-native invasive species, fishery sustainability, forestry practices, wildlife values, shoreline and stream bank modifications, and this includes riparian habitat. There were so many issues that came up that we had to actually put them into categories and subsections to actually manage them properly and uh, have a short-term and long-term uh, planning and management involved with this. Okay. So the three main categories that we decided to put them in to manage them is core operation initiative, which is our primary, like our office and things that we do there, uh, public education and community involvement initiatives, and our monitoring programs, which includes fisheries and wildlife. Uh, under our core operations, we do have a new location, and if anybody has been there, we're at the Welcome Center, and we now have a gallery. So all our stuff, there's more than this, um, is set up on a continual basis, and people can see it all the time, and we can put all the newest information out there right away. Um, we assist with environmental queries. We house reports, maps, and data. We do uh, best management practices. We have a resource library of public education. 
and uh, a lot of people that are involved in the management plan have local knowledge and experience and also have professionals on board with us and a vast amount of community participation. And there's Bob Freeman's Otter. So, um, so core funding is still pending for 2013. We do have project specific funding in place uh, to do a new bulletin, which I'll talk about in a minute. We uh, maintain our partnerships in all levels of government, and we also have signed memorandums of understanding uh, connected with the Watershed Management Plan. Uh, we have dedicated directors, as Grace was saying, uh, members, volunteers, staff, and professionals. Um, we review it once a year, and that helps us set our priorities. And, um, and of course, the proceedings of this meeting uh, are available on YouTube, and that's where we're being videotaped now because I found it's much easier for people to go on YouTube and watch specific speakers and hear the questions than it is to read a 28 page report. So um, we're, we're trying it that way now. So, under public education, we do the annual late cleanup day, which uh, is always a really great turnout in the community, and this is some of our young stewards. and. Uh, it was a great event. And we're not getting as much garbage, which is really nice. Um, but uh, a lot of people show up. I think we had 58 people show up this year. Um, educational programs with partners, such as uh, Barb's group, Boundary Invasive Species Society, and Jenny's group, Randy Wilderness Society. And um, we all took a course with Wild BC. It's a teacher's program to teach youth about uh, different uh, modules and. Uh, the environment, so that was a lot of fun. It was difficult for me because my kids are in their 30s, so it was hard getting back to the toddler and the youngster stage of it all. Come on in. Um, and we are going to do a wetland keepers course in the spring, and we're going to do a bathhouse program in later in the winter and spring. And we're all going to work together with Barb and Jen to do some loop and obstacle stuff. And uh, Jen's going to talk a little bit more about. Uh, the Boundary Habitat Stewards and some of the current initiatives she's doing um, right now. Uh, BearAware is a very popular program and uh, it's in partnership with the uh, Conservation Officer Service and the Force, uh, Ministry of Forest or Ministry of Natural Forest, whatever. Oh, the yeah, the multiple agency thing. Anyway, Dave is not here yet, so hopefully Dave is going to show up and uh, so we'll that. Uh, we also uh, provide free uh, septic inspection kits for homeowners that would like to see if they are uh, suffering from septic leachate. Uh, BC Timber Sales, Don Guido will be discussing harvesting plans. Uh, I've already talked about the YouTube, how we put the information out there for that. Uh, this past summer we hired a student, she's gone back for a master's, Joanna de Montreal. And she did some amazing work with kids and uh, discover water, fun in the forest, amazing animals, orienteering, fantastic fish, beautiful birds, like on and on and on. And twice a week we did bear wear. Every Saturday it was for all ages. So that was very well attended. And, and the best thing about it is they love the dead bears and the skulls. But anything dead, kids just go crazy over that stuff. So that was a lot of fun and we had a lot of uh, kids uh, involved in that. Some new initiatives and involvement. The APC is quite new. I've not been on there, what, six years now or something? But uh, Boundary Habitat Stewards just starting to get involved with that, and Jenny's going to talk about that. Uh, the Kettle River Watershed Management Plan, Stakeholders Committee, I'm involved in that, and Graham's going to talk about that in um, his presentation. Um, getting the information out there, we redid the uh, nature kiosk. Uh, I think if those of you who remember, it was big. somebody tried to burn it down last year. So we did the repairs on that, and we redid all the displays in the kiosk. And those pictures, other pictures there, are the new interpretive gallery that we have set up at the Welcome Center. Uh, I don't know what most of you that live here may have seen the kiosk at the uh, RDKB boat launch in Marina, and the one at the um, Sandler Creek, and those are the signs that are on there. And this year we have a new brochure uh, regarding wetlands and riparian areas that coincides with the information on the signs that you read out there. Um, 
we have our fisheries uh, educational bulletin and wildlife bulletin and we just found out we got the funding for to do uh, Christine Lake, our underwater world, which we'll be talking about. All those aquatic plants that we know about milfoil, but there's a lot of other ones, there's 53 in total that have been identified in the lake. And we'll also be talking about uh, other species of concern provincially or regionally. And we also do the green boating guide and we do spill kits. Uh, we do have an endowment fund that's uh, through the Phoenix Foundation and that can be uh, donated to uh, the, the Grand Forks Credit Union and you do get a charitable receipt. Uh, Eurasian water milfoil. Um, this past spring, uh, the CLSS and RDKB put on a conference called Exploring the Potential of Biological Control of Eurasian Water Milfoil in BC. And it brought together a lot of great key personnel, people that deal with uh, milfoil and we kind of did some brainstorming about the milfoil weevil. And there's uh, RDKB hired in Bioscience to do the surveys and samples were sent to Ottawa and that was confirmed that they were the actual milfoil weevil. We all went, yay! So uh, looking into mass rearing, RDKB is for that one. Um, and Andy and Alan will be talking about the milfoil program that, um, and what happened this year. And that's the little bug right there. <laughs> okay, now we're going into our monitoring programs and this includes water quality, fisheries and wildlife. Uh, thank you so much to Dave, Beatty and Glenn Burr. Um, these guys have been doing the water quality sampling for years and years. And Mike Sokol uh, from MOE will be presenting this year's sampling results. And you can see on the, what we sample for up on the screen. We have been doing the zebra and quagga muscle monitoring program now for four years using that contraption on the end there with the PVC pipe. It's called an artificial substrate sampler. Uh, we have two sites on the lake on the south end. We're going to be uh, amping it up to five sites in 2013. And that's the top of zebra, underneath is the quagga mussel. And early detection efforts also say that we should be doing plankton um, hulls, so we're going to try that in 2013. And the first line of defense is education. We don't have them, we don't want them. And Barb Stewart will be talking about what we learned at a conference in Kelowna that uh, was in October. And I'm repeating it, but there they are close up. And this is how awful they get. Um, they go in your intakes and they're nasty. These are some other horrific things that are coming down the pipe. Um, American bullfrogs, a lot of you know that they're on the coast and that they're on Vancouver Island and that they've been there for a couple of decades. That picture on the bottom is actually the tadpole. That's how big they are. These frogs can take down baby ducks. Um, so they're huge. And what happened is the story was on Vancouver Island when they were first found at Elk Lake was that somebody brought them in to want to, uh, to do the uh, Frog Lake, you know, gourmet thing, and then it didn't work out, so we put them in that lake and they moved around. And then, of course, you heard about the uh, northern snakehead in Bur is it Burnaby Lake? Yeah, yeah, Burnaby Lake. That they had to drain that. It's a man-made lake um, to get kill it. And uh, there's been other stories about DFO going into the restaurants in Vancouver and seizing tanks because they are, you know, some people like to eat them. And the other ones are the red-eared slider. That these are all escaped from pets, people that buy turtles and they run away or something. And then Didymo um, is another thing that is coming. Is it around anywhere? What lake is that in now? It's unconfirmed in the Kettle River. Unconfirmed in the Kettle River, okay. Well, it doesn't mean it's there. It's just that there was a report it hasn't been confirmed, yeah. so. Yeah. Um, we also like to monitor uh, species at risk. And we'd like to have people report it to us, take pictures and ID. If you have a GPS unit, do that too. And then we send it to the province so they can actually map where these creatures are. And some of them are the western rattlesnake, and most people don't want to take pictures of western rattlesnakes. But we did have one in our freezer that was killed on the highway that was sent to Victoria for DNA analysis. The little guy in the ponderosa pines, the screech owl. Rubber boa is another species at risk. Many of you may have seen them around here. Uh, Western skink, uh, they, they lose the blue in their tail when they get older. So when you see the stripes in the front and the whole the critters like that, that's a Western skink. And that little guy there, I have kind of an enlarged specimen over there, 
and ceramic is a, tiger, a blotched tiger cell method. So if you see any of these, just report it. It's good to know that we have them. Uh, string spawning protein enumerations. Uh, we did a DNA analysis through UBC Okanagan in uh, 2011. The only native stock that we have left are the shore spawners. The kokanee uh, stream spawners are introduced from stocking in the early 1900s. And these uh, stream spawners are late August to September. Shore spawners are December to uh, January. But uh, ice, people ice fishing on the lake at the beginning of March found a, a potential new uh, genetic species that were spawning right through till uh, ice off into April. So we sent samples in and we have heard back about that. And we, we haven't mapped reds uh, for Copley, but they're on the map over there in red. Um, and we probably will start uh, doing that again to see if we've lost any uh, short spawning Copley sites. Uh, Sandra Creek this year, I think most of you know what the count was, but it was phenomenal. <coughs> Hopefully the video will run on the, the square box there. Anyways, I've got at the office on our interactive video display, there's 15,210 fish, and Doug Shan uh, brought his GoPro and put it underwater, and it's just an amazing video. It's probably something to do with um, the version of PowerPoint. Maybe, okay. Okay, so maybe we can run it at coffee break separately? Yeah. And how would that work? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've got it actually on my other user. Um, Sutherland Creek was 197. That's not a high number, but it's higher than it's been in five years. Um, Gray Creek was 176, and this is awesome, even though it used to be historically the second highest count. The Gray Creek came in with no fish for four years at all. So 176 means that, you know, um, things have blown out a bit, uh, some of the gravel's back in place, and um, it's starting to work again. As long as we don't get drought and it doesn't get high and dry again, um, we're hoping it continues. So this is just a comparison graph about from 2004 to 2012. Basically, to this year's count was the highest we've had it, and I look back to the records to 1985, and it's the highest that's ever been counted since then. And you can see it's flat lined out sometimes on Sand and McRae, and um, that's where our coconut are going right now. Uh, North Bay Boy Project is a wetland protection initiative that the uh, milfoil divers put out the boys every year and take them out every fall. And there's some species at risk in there, and there is concerns with old crops bringing in and spreading the milfoil around. And Greg and from Redfish Consulting will be presenting information on the tropic structure of the Stina Lake, which is the food water. Uh, we still do inventory on the lake. Uh, every single property and crown land um, is documented just for the foreshore and below the high water line, just to see um, how things are going and what's happening. And that's how we find out if Kokanee uh, Secretary has been altered and how if we've lost anything. Uh, Christine Lake Dock Removal, that's these audience guys in the room, the directors. It's a big, big, big job taking up docks. You can see how much star foam that floats around our lake if they're not disposed of properly. And that's uh, Peter and Doug and, and Paul Idle and you guys there anyway. So they, I can't remember, Peter, how many docks did you do this year? Four. Four. So, yeah, big job. <clears throat> Uh, this is some of the funders that we had for 2012. Um, Regional District of Kootenai Boundary, RBC Blue Water Project, Phoenix Foundation, uh, Province of BC, Forest BC, and TD Friends of the Environment. Um, a big thanks goes out to all the volunteers. And, and the little clouds are put some of the jobs that they do. And this year, the calculation for in-kind contributions. Everybody fills in sheets for their hours, and it's calculated and put under specific <coughs> projects. Up to yesterday, it came to $148,614.88. Yeah. Okay. And um, if you have any questions or concerns, um, please do call me. And um, we love Christine Lake, it's ours to enjoy, and um, we love it here. So if you have any questions, we have an open forum at the end, and I'll stay over here and take it to everybody. <laughs> yeah.
Okay, thank you, Brenda. You can obviously see how much work the uh, stewardship does for Christina Lake. So now that we know what the, the whole presentation is about, and Brenda gave you a beautiful overview on what's going to happen today, we'd like to know who you are so that everybody understands who's in the room and if they're affiliated with someone in particular or if they have a, a primary interest in being here other than just loving Christina Lake. Andy. Uh, I'm Andy Gilmore, and I'm the supervisor of the Eurasia Nopal program. Alan Stanley, Regional District, Director of Environmental Services. And Mark Anderson with the Regional District, Director of Planning. And I'm Terry Mooney, I'm on the Christine Lake ABC. Glenn Brewer, uh, <coughs> Brian Lake. No, Carol, Grandport Club, I'm sure <coughs> Brian Alphick, uh, BC Parks, I'm your supervisor for the East Oak Common Area. Don and Marilyn Lister, new residents of the lake. <coughs> Anna Stevenson with Christina Lake Healthcare Auxiliary and a waterfront owner. Donna Dean, I'm a planner at the Regional District. Ian Robbins, I'm a local resident and soon to be a member of the Stewardship Society. Don Vito, Practices Sports Group with BC Timber Sales and Grand Forks. My Inga Russell, planner for BC Timber Sales and Natural Forks and Natural Resources. Bonnie Rivin, Natural Resource Officer out of Grand Forks for Ministry of Forest Lands Natural Resources. Eric Shannon, Crystal Lake Stewardship Society. Kara Adrian, Master's Student Can everybody hear me? No. Okay. All right. Kara Adrian, a Master's Student at the University of Lethbridge, and I am Director of the Center. Cher Wires, City of Grand Forks Environment Committee. Tyler Washington, International Forest Products, <coughs> and I'm a woodlot owner as well. I own a woodlot up uh, some of them to the creek. And uh, I'm proposing an uh, eco-village in Christina Lake, owner of Serenity Wonders and Spot. Diana Thomas, assistant to MLA. John Slayer, MLA for the survey. Paul Bell, citizen and volunteer. Uh, Bart Fuzzy, uh, one of the divers of the World Boat Program. All right. Uh, Mike Thurwinder, Christina Lake Waterfront Property Owner Society. Uh, Sally Hammond, and I'm over from the Spokane Lake Stewardship Society. Susan Harrison, I'm the Secretary for the Stewardship. Uh, Barb Stewart, I'm a director on the Christina Lake Stewardship of Camarot Creek. Cassandra? Cassandra from Grandpa. Kathy O'Malley, I'm on the Scottish River Board, Shepherd Monica Colesill, Randy Wilderness. Jenny Colesill, Randy Wilderness. Gloria <coughs> Ronderman, Property Owner. I'm Graham Dock, <coughs> uh, Project Coordinator for the Kettle River Watershed Management Fund, and I'm on track for the region this year. Rose Van Brewer, I'm with the Christine Lake Games and Center. Bruce Cunningham from Denver. I would be I'm a newly elected director of the uh, Spokane Lake Stewardship Society. And I'll just say that we just recently completed the value study uh, and are trying to get the regional district engaged in actually getting a, our plan together. There is none at the moment. So any of you have information that can help us uh, along with any of the other two. Character Brenda. Oh, director of the Society. Craig Hanson, Director of the Society and uh, Boat Access Property Owner. Dave Grand, Advisory Planning Commission. Mike Sokol, Impact Assessment Biologist for Ministry of Environment. Carol Bowen, Boat Access Property Owner. Peter Bowen, also Boat Access Property Owner, Trustee of the Distribution Center. So what a fantastic group. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We're really going to hear some good information. So we're going to jump right in. Remember, there's lunch served here today, and you, of course, will have a fantastic lunch. We always do that. And it'll be served uh, overlooking Christina Lake, as you can tell. So what a nice place to be. What a beautiful weather for us. We're going to jump right in and talk about 2012 water quality review with Mike Sokol. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mike Sokol. 
presenters, I hope you've given Barb, uh, you know, whatever she needs to operate the PowerPoint for you if, if you need to that bad. Richard just walked in. Richard White. We just introduced everybody, so another APC member. Thank you, Richard, for being here. Um, just before I start, I just wanted to uh, see a, a show of hands um, who's concerned about water quality at Christina Lake. <laughs> is, is anyone having a hard time hearing me? That's the next question. Okay, I will try to speak up as much as I can. Excellent. I was really happy to see that all, almost all or all the hands went up. Uh, my next question to you is then, um, how many of you believe that you actually have poor water quality at Christina Lake? Okay, that, that, that's also good too. Um, so, so. We've got a video going on, yeah. and I think if, if the video can't hear you, then we're going to have a problem. Okay. So do you mind? Thank you very much. It's on. Carry on. All right, I'll, uh, I'll continue there. Um, I'll have to tone my, my voice down a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, water quality, uh, in the lake, excellent. Uh, we want to keep it that way. Um, so the monitoring that the stewardship society does uh, is really invaluable uh, to, to our efforts. Uh, just uh, logistically, we can't come up here all the time and do all the samples, so it is a, a really big help to us. Um, it would be great if, if you could call sorts of sampling, um, but doing the uh, second depth of water clarity and doing temperature profiles uh, is, is a much help. So thank you for that. Just put it in a, a regional context um, from the Ministry of Environment uh, standpoint. We've got uh, the uh, large lakes in the Okanagan as part of our uh, regional monitoring. And we've got the upper Shufok lakes and we've got Christina Lake. Um, officially, the uh, Nelson office uh, for Red uh now looks after this area, but because they don't have a boat and I do, lucky me, um, <laughs> I get to keep, keep uh, coming here and doing sampling. So, um, and we also have the history with uh, doing sampling here as well. So uh, it will continue for the uh, foreseeable future. So generally, the, uh, the goal of the lake sampling program, uh, why do we actually sample? So uh, it provides water quality data uh, for a variety of, of uh, individuals. So uh, the, the general public, uh, decision makers, um, all this data is, is used in a variety of ways. So uh, we want to assess the uh, status and trends. So the status is the uh, kind of current status, or this year's status, or the past couple of years, and trends uh, looking more long-term trends. So uh, trying to uh, figure out what's natural uh, climatic variation, because there are uh, natural things going on all the time, uh, versus what um, anthropogenic or uh, man-made sources of, of pollution might be doing uh, to the lake. So that's some of the reasons why we do it. So we also compare the, um, the uh, status and trends to uh, objectives. And these objectives were originally set in uh, 1994. Um, and last year we actually did a, um, a full, full review um, of those um, objectives. Um, and the, because we are short staffed, uh, still working on it, um, that was the promise that I made uh, in my talk last year that I did fulfill and, and I apologize, but uh, I'm, I'm still working on that data. Um, but so far, um, it, it, everything was met except for, um, I believe, uh, water clarity, uh, because it was a really high runoff year uh, in, in the spring, uh, which decreased the average. But overall, again, water quality is quite good. Uh, so some of the key parameters that we look at, so there's um, uh, physical, chemical, and some biological parameters. So uh, physical second depth is your water clarity. There's temperature, there's a variety of nutrients, uh, primarily uh, phosphorus and uh, nitrogen, um, silica ions, and the uh, biological component is chlorophyll A, which is, you can uh, infer, algal productivity, so they have um, algae living in the water. Um, in the spring, we also look at a few other parameters, um, such as uh, hardness uh, and then some other ions. So where do we sample? We've got two sampling sites. Uh, one in the north in the deep basin um, has been sampled since 91, and uh, the longer, uh, shallower site uh, is sampled for uh, 40 years now. 
And uh, we do this ring and fall sampling, and the uh, Stewardship Society does the um, uh, bi weekly or close to bi weekly, depending on weather, um, for uh, temperature and set. So, again, we're looking at long term trends, the current status of this year, and um, I, can, I can touch on some of the uh, attainment objectives and um, the, uh, how, how we do compare it to previous years. So just, just real basic, um, pretty much the um, phosphorus is the uh, nutrient of, of key concern uh, in, in the lake. Uh, when you have an increase in, in, in phosphorus, um, it, it, ch it changes the, the entire um, uh, lake trophic status. So uh, you increase nutrients, you increase algae, you increase algae blooms, uh, and you can change uh, fish productivity and all sorts of different things going on. So it currently is a, a clear water oligotrophic lake. Um, compared to something like uh, a Suez Lake, um, which has much higher nutrients and a um, much higher incidence of, uh, of algal blooms. So uh, they, uh, the total phosphorus flow there in the little biograph, uh, that was done in 94. Um, it's likely very similar to current conditions. The only thing uh, that might be a little bit different is the uh, sector components and phosphorus. So possibly decreasing those and increasing the uh, watershed sources. So watershed sources is um, usually natural things coming into the uh, into the streams and then coming into the lake itself. So this first graph, um, I'll try and be um, as as little technical as as I can. Um, so essentially, the, um, uh, the value there for for 2012 is quite a bit lower than the than, uh, than the value of last year. It's not to say that things are uh, were bad last year and incredibly better this year. It's just just one value in, in a time series trend. So, um, what I thought was happening uh, over the past kind of six or seven years was on the upswing of the natural uh, climatic cycle. Uh, this year, with that drop, uh, it could be coming back down. It is a little bit difficult to say. So, so that's why. I, when, when I come here, um, I sometimes sounds sound like a broken record and keep saying the same thing, but it's hard to assess um, status and trends without looking at the, the, uh, the bigger picture. Uh, so this is values in the fall, again, uh, quite a bit lower, and this is in the, uh, in the south basin. Uh, north basin, so it's a shorter time series, but again, you can see that kind of cyclical trend, uh, and the uh, value for 2012 is, uh, is lower. And again, same for the uh, for the fall as well. Um, so this here is the uh, chlorophyllase. So this is a, a measure of the uh, phytoplankton biomass. So the, the microscopic algae that's actually growing uh, in the water column. Uh, the objective is for less than 2.5, um, and it pretty much always meets that. And you can see on the uh, left hand side that the seasonal averages, um, because we don't come up here all the time. Um, the last time we did it was uh, was last year, and then in. Uh, 2006. So the, the mean value over the entire growing season uh, is quite low, uh, which is good to see. So this is the uh, second depth um, for uh, for the season. So um, it starts out kind of low to moderate in the in the early spring season when we sample, uh, increases a bit, and then comes back down over the season. The kind of a natural natural progression there. And uh, we want to look at the average values uh, over that entire season because one one point value may not be indicative of what's actually going on. So, so essentially, um, without that big blue box in the area, we wouldn't really know what's going on. So again, thanks to the uh, Social Society for that for that information. Uh, so for the early season, um, when when there's um, a lot of clear water. Um, and uh, not much runoff coming in yet. Um, the uh, phytoplankton uh, biomass is actually uh, relatively low. It increases um, as, as the uh, runoff increases and as nutrients increase. And then as a result of it, increased algae, you get an increase in zooplankton, which are eating the algae, and then you get a, um, uh, an, an increase in, in, uh, in the uh, actual second. So it is kind of a natural thing that, that goes on. And um, it's, it should be uh, greater than 10 meters, uh, around 9.7 as, as an average for this year, pretty close. Uh, but it's in step with some of the other previous values. So I uh, probably should have just chosen the circle instead of the explosion similar. It doesn't mean that those are bad. It's just um, it is in, in step with, uh, with uh, other years. So um, it isn't anything of 
outside of the ordinary privilege. Uh, this one's a little bit messy, but it's just showing the uh, comparison of the uh, dissolved oxygen in the water. So dissolved oxygen is important for, for aquatic life, especially for, for fish. So you need a, um, enough oxygen for them to actually survive. Um, so the objective is for, uh, for at, at any depth to be greater than uh, greater than 8 millimeters per liter. Uh, the only time where, where it's below that is at the uh, deepest layer of the lake. And this pretty much happens all the time. Um, so this is one of the things where I don't think that objective is actually ever going to be attainable. It's just one of those natural things that, that I, I, I will be uh, changing uh, any objective document. So, uh, but it's still great news for fish. There's a ton of oxygen in there, there's no problems whatsoever. And uh, 2012 in the yellow there uh, fits right in, uh, in the middle of the average. Some, some years it's higher, some years it's, it's a little bit lower. It's really not a big deal. Uh, the lower values at, at depth is, is a result of uh, natural decomposition and the consumption of oxygen in those bottom layers. So um, if, if the fish doesn't like it, it's got the entire water column to, to survive, so no problems there. Uh, this here is a step two. So uh, as the season progresses, and you probably can't, can't see it too well, but each of those lines is just a different date and time. So it starts out with that vertical blue one. Um, in the early spring, and that's pretty much how it is over the winter. You get this straight line, the, uh, the, the lake is very well mixed, um, fairly uh, constant temperature. As the, um, as the temperatures warm up, um, you get this kind of bending of that, of that curve, so that the surface waters begin, uh, become warmer, and you get what's called the thermal kind. So, so that kind of bending of the line, where that bend is, is, is that abrupt change um, in the uh, temperature. So the, uh, the air isn't warm enough to to, um, uh, to increase the water temperature at depth, and then it still comes straight back down uh, to those lower. So the, the bottom waters um, are pretty low at constant temperature for the, the entire year. It's just the surface uh, layer that changes. And it's very similar at the north and south basin, just the, uh, uh, some slight differences here and there. And then uh, one thing I did notice is that I, this year I actually increased my drafts a little bit. Um, uh, 225 uh, because it's one of the uh, warmest August temperatures uh, that, that we have on record um, from the uh, stewardship data. So um, it is a huge increase, uh, but we know only about 0.3 to 0.5 of a degree increase, but it is an increase. So it was a warm year. And if you look at uh, climate trend data um, for all of North America, uh, 2012 was actually one of the warmest years on record. <coughs> So this here is a uh, relationship between the chloric delay, uh, which I mentioned, the dissolved oxygen and the temperature. So um, in that thermocline area um, is, is where you have an increase uh, in the algae, which is the green line of chloric delay, and that coincides with the increase in dissolved oxygen. So as a microscopic uh, the plants in the water are, um, uh, are living, they provide more, more oxygen to the water. Um, so so if, if you're a fisherman, uh, that's I would suggest that's the area you want to target, a kind of 10 to, 10 to 15 meter area, that's where you will have most of So in, uh, in summary here, um, these, these are all the objectives on the right hand side there. So everything was met except for, for a couple of points. Um, so even though I didn't do um, a seasonal average chlorophyll A. I, I just put a range there. It was, it, it was very limited, uh, but it, it is still quite low. So it likely was met, even though we weren't sure. It was met every other year previously. Um, the uh, second depth in, in the south basin, 9.1, pretty close. Uh, both, um, both basins actually were, uh, were lower in clarity last year, and I think that was because of the uh, very high runoff um, um, that we had in the spring. Um, and it, it could be the similar thing this year. Um, there, there were a lot of reports of uh, some big storms and that could be uh, starting things up and increasing um, uh, just natural turbidity in the water column and changing the water clarity, but it's nothing really to be worried about. And the other thing I mentioned was the uh, dissolved oxygen in the, uh, in the bottom of the water is going to fall. So uh, just at, at the lowest levels in the deep part of the basin, um, there was uh, lower oxygen than expected, but still. Uh, definitely uh, survivable for, for fish. So um, I will be uh, posting the information uh, on the MOE website, which hopefully will be getting redone over the next couple of years, because uh, it's kind of a mess to work through. Um, I even have a hard time finding some things on there. 
Um, so we will be continuing the uh, springfall monitoring that, that we that we do, and hopefully the associate groups will both see their their work as well. Um, so there. Uh, for the attainment work that we did last year, um, last year I presented on a variety of, of other work that we did. So looking at uh, rock scrapings with algae growing in the near shore areas. Um, so um, that's currently being um, uh, written up into a, a report and I'll have this, a summary on our website. And once once I have that summary, then I can forward it to, to Brenda and I can be posted on, on the Sturgeon site as well. And again, Sturgeon sampling, thanks, and hopefully we can continue that. Um, so just briefly, a couple of future issues and some monitoring that, that we're working on. So the uh, uh, efforts are still needed to reduce non-point sources. So a lot of the point sources, which are direct things, you can kind of point your finger at, okay, I, I see right here there's something coming into the lake, that's something that you can control. Non-point is much more much more difficult to, to deal with. Uh, and that's the, the, um, the larger water quality issues anywhere are non-point sources. So, so those are more diffuse uh, watershed issues. So um, it, it's difficult to, to actually uh, do anything um, uh, to, to, to help with those, but watershed planning is a, is a huge step. Uh, the work that the Associate Group does with, with education is, is a huge thing. Uh, people fixing up uh, leaky septics, that's, that's a huge thing. So bit by bit, it, it, things are increasing and getting better. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, of uh, potential emerging issues. Uh, so I put EDT, which is interview disrupting compounds, personal care products, and that sort of thing. Um, the, uh, the early work that we're seeing uh, in the Okanagan uh, is, is suggesting that um, from the sewage treatment plants uh, that have it, their, the levels of the compounds are extremely low. Um, I would expect them to be even lower here at, at Christina Lake because there isn't any, any large sources uh, coming into the lake uh, from septics. Is likely a very very small small amount. Um, so it, it's something that that, that could be uh, uh, potentially problematic in the future. Uh, but I, I, I really do that here. Uh, I'm live turn three. Um, next one is uh, zebra and quagga mussels and other invasive species. So uh, Barb will, will be talking about that briefly. So I also attended the um, the workshop on the uh, invasive mussels, and uh, I have to say it was actually quite quite eye opening. Like I. Coming from Ontario, I, I've known uh, a lot about zebra and mussels in the Great Lakes and the destruction that they've, that they've caused. Um, if they ever do get into Christina Lake, it'll change the entire ecosystem. But the whole lake will be changed, there, as you know it. So it's extremely important to, to educate the public and boats coming in to, to, uh, to not have these invasive attached to their holes. Um, there was a scary incident up in the um, uh, up in Shushwak Lake, uh, where they, these uh, the critters were found. Uh, luckily, they, they were dead and not viable, but it is something to, to be on the lookout for. Uh, very important. So. Uh, one point to note um, just before so, there's um, uh, the mussels actually um, require a, a certain amount of uh, calcium uh, in, the, in the water uh, to, to build their shells, just, just natural, uh, natural levels. Um, uh, Environment Canada has done a, a risk assessment of um, water bodies across Canada, um, and but, but they were on a, on a very large scale. So pretty much all of BC was uh, the high risk area, um, except for some of the saltwater lakes on Vancouver Island and the coast. Uh, but looking through the data uh, in the Okanagan, um, we're in, in the high risk area there. Uh, but and then looking at the, the numbers for Christina Lake, um, it's actually quite low. Um, so calcium values are low, so that does decrease the, the, uh, the risk a little bit, which is a really good thing to, uh, to see. Uh, I, I assume that the values were a little bit higher. Not the case. So it doesn't mean that, that they can't come here and can't set up shop and, and kind of ruin everything, but there, there is still a, a, a possibility there. Um, if you want to talk more about that, we can talk more, more about that offline. Um, and continue monitoring. I'm going to keep doing that. And uh, thanks very much to the uh, Social Society for, for letting me come here and speak. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I can take those. Or if not, you can always grab me a coffee or something else. Thank you. Mike, you had, uh, had a pie chart on it that uh, had a breakdown of the sources of the various nutrients uh, that we relate. I have a couple questions around that. First of all, how that breakdown is determined. And secondly, you commented that the breakdown is probably a little bit off in terms of the 
the amount uh, sourced from septics versus watersheds, right? and what you might have driven back to. Yeah, um, that was done in, in 94, so that was the, day, the same time things were, were, uh, were done for the um, setting of the water quality message. So that was an, an entire uh, look at, at the water source, uh, source sorry, that day, the water source is coming into play and doing uh, modeling on the actual load of, of phosphorus. So that, that was just phosphorus load. Um, so it's looking at uh, how much is actually coming in from every single creek, how much is in the lake itself, and then extrapolating that to uh, how much will, would be dry deposition from the atmosphere. And then also um, the, the third operations you can do for um, how many um, um, how many septic um, uh, fields and tank there are around a body of water and, and then to calculate that. And so that was, it, it, it isn't exact, but it, it's probably a, a really good estimate. It hasn't been, been done since because it involves a lot of work that we can and you speculated that there's like a change between septic sources and water sources? Yeah, that's, that's just speculation on, on my part from uh, over the past um, uh, 20 years of, of, of just education and, and people getting things fixed and, and just uh, approving things and that sort of thing. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm going to ask you to all right, presentation. Thank you very much. And a good message, too, I might add, right, Mike? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're going to shake it up a little bit because I believe we're missing uh, Greg Andrzej. Am I correct? Casey snuck in and I did not. So we're going to jump to uh, Barb Stewart. Barb is uh, director for the Crystal Lake Stewardship. She's a biologist. She's also known as a weed lady. <laughs> and she's a uh, phenomenal person to work with. She's going to talk about the lovely zebra and vital muscles and the issue of surrounding those. Right, Barb? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Barb's Thank you. Thank you. So I think that was a really good introduction by Mike there to um, you know, zebra and quad muscles, which is certainly a, an up-and-coming issue. Um, earlier this summer, you might have seen the news reports around um, the invasive muscles that were discovered. I want to provide a, a bit of context. I'm, I'm going to talk more around the rules and kind of where we are with legislation preventing this as a big part of it, because I'm certainly not a muscle expert, and um, I certainly have taken some slides from some other presentations of people who are muscle experts. So uh, this actually occurred um, up in Chuchuac Lake. What it is is um, this boat had come out of Arizona, and it was actually on a commercial hauler. There are actually inspection stations um, throughout Idaho that do require inspections to see if there is muscles and invasive muscles. Um, but they were unable to stop that hauler because it was commercial. Um, they did warn BC and let staff know that this boat was coming. Because this isn't the only incidents that happened. There was 11 um, reported incidents last year of boats that were destined for BC that were um, stopped on the way here. Uh, and this year, I believe it was number by the end of the season was up over 12 boats this year that had muscles on them were headed for BC. So this is definitely an issue. Uh, we are fortunate that um, Idaho is doing inspections, but we're really concerned about what's coming from eastern Canada. Um, so anyway, this boat did make it up to Shushwap. Um Because of the change in staff, the message didn't get through. It was like a week or two week delay. Finally, they said, oh no, the boat's already here. They found the boat, checked, and they do have a, a monitoring program. So far, everything's showing negative that it wasn't um, alive. But you know, they will be continuing to monitor for a couple of years because it's really, really hard to know because there's these little tiny things that you have to sample for. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the muscles. So we did have this workshop to learn a bit about it because it's something that BC hasn't really faced before. I mean, Eastern Canada certainly had the issue for quite a long time. So this is a picture of. Uh, the muscles over here, they're actually very small. Um, Brenda does have some samples here if anyone wants to see the actual muscles. And there's this great uh, paperweight. They're actually very small. They can get into very small cracks. Um, there's many programs around trying on education to try to prevent the introduction um, of these muscles. Basically past uh, west of the 100th Meridian, there's this 100th Meridian initiative right now um, where they're trying to, to slow the spread from it coming west. As Mike had mentioned, um, at the workshop, we did have the opportunity to hear um, about the risk assessment that had been done by um, 
Department of Fisheries and Ocean Staff. And, and so I've actually grabbed this slide from uh, Scott Higgins. He's a, a, a biologist with the department. And he said I could use some of these slides. So this is a picture. All the blue dots are actually known infestations of zebra or quagga mussels. Uh, and the red is the a risk of, of where, um, or the proximity to invaded habitat. So basically those are kind of the watersheds that might drain into. Um, as I mentioned, there were, oh, sorry, there was, they had recorded five boats destined for BC. Uh, I think in Idaho they'd actually found more as well. So this is, um, it's definitely something where it's on the move. Um, initially it started up in the Great Lakes region, it's yeah, certainly moved down this direction. I'm very concerned with it moving either up here or across uh, Canada into BC. Um, as Mike had mentioned, um, what they found, initially they were thinking that um, the mussels had certain requirements for calcium levels, but they're finding they're adapting too and actually doing fairly well in some of the areas with lower levels, so they're actually very adaptive. Um, and I think there's a difference between zebra and quagga as to how, how much they adapt, but for our purposes right now, since we don't have either, it's a matter of prevention. But Christina Lake does fit into the I believe it's the water, is that right, Mike? Uh, very low, nine, nine to 11. Very, very low, okay, so it's down in, in this category here. So uh, at the presentation we learned a bit about some of the economic costs of, of these little mussels. What they do is they, they can have several million babies per mussel per year, so it's an exponential growth increase. Um, in Eastern Canada, they found that it was a $350,000 cost per facility per year for having to clean the mussels. Um, from what we've heard, um, I had the opportunity to do a tour with uh, Fortis BC at their dam facilities and learn a bit about the cost to a hydroelectric. And they said once they're um, confirmed in the river system, they have three years to repair. Um, and basically that will mean they'll have to put anti-fouling paint on every surface within the dams. They're going to have to probably um, put in um, chlorine injection systems to help keep some of the smaller pipes within the dams clean. And all of this cost, of course, is going to be transferred directly to who? The consumer. So even the hydroelectric companies don't want to see this come, um, and certainly consumers shouldn't. It's here in Christina Lake, we don't have any dams. We certainly do get our power from dams within the Columbia system. Uh, but there's a lot of landowners with water intakes in the lake, and that's going to be a real problem with clogging those water intakes. Of course, there are impacts to fisheries, recreation, and beach cleanup. Basically, once the mussels are in an area, you can't walk on your beaches without shoes. So I, I just pulled. Um, Scott had given very detailed information about um, the impacts, but I, I just pulled some of the, the summaries because, you know, I don't think that we need to know all the details about the life cycle of the mussels, but we certainly need to know that, yeah, there's going to be some, some problems. Um, we hope this presentation would actually follow the talk on, uh, the talk about the, the plant life cycle, or the, sorry, the, the food web within the lake, because that might make more sense. But basically what they found out in Eastern Canada is a decline in the phytoplankton across all the ecosystems. Um, so then there was promotion of uh, toxin producing species, so you can have algal blooms, uh, what is it, the blue-green algae that um, can cause a lot of problems. They have increases in macrophyte and benthic algae growth and distribution. Um, so then we have, um, so what's going to happen is it will completely change the food web within any inf invaded uh, lakes. Um, they don't know, they're saying that there's more of an impact on smaller systems and larger systems, and it's pretty tough to compare what happened in Ontario and whether that would happen here because our situation is different. Um, they have cascading higher, or impacts to higher trophic levels, so what, what that means is that um, the zooplankton and zoobenthos will completely change. So this is some of the, the critters within our, our um, food web. And you'll have declines in uh, species that are more deep water species and increases in species that are more shallow water. So potentially things like bass and milfoil would potentially increase because there's increased nutrient loadings in the shallows. Did I get that right, Brenda? <laughs> It's not my specialty. Yeah, I mean, it's not mine either, but I find it really fascinating. But 
Um, and then that means that our native species that use the deeper depths could be really, really, really impacted. Um, there's an importance of the ecosystem size. They said there's higher effects in smaller ecosystems, um, but they have had high effects in some of the large ecosystems as well. And from the evidence in the east, um, all the indicators suggest the impacts persist for greater than 20 years, so it doesn't recover after. And so they feel it's a very high ecological impact. So this is some pictures of um, some areas that have been highly impacted. This is um, Laurentian Great Lakes and Baltic Sea. So this is what happens when we have increased growth within the shallow zones, and they're actually covering everything. It just, it's basically choking out a lot of um, the normal critters that would be in those shallower zones. Um, of course, it also um, declined, <laughs> have issues with recreational use, as you can see, um, and it can result in declining property values. So, um, and the higher risk to people with uh, pathogen bacteria. So it, you know, this is probably, fortunately our lake is really low calcium and probably wouldn't see real high, or hopefully wouldn't see real high increases in them. But um, that's the extreme case. It's a very serious issue. So I want to talk a bit about um, the Idaho inspection stations. Um, in Idaho they have a, and in several of the other U.S. states they have um, some form of inspection as well, but in Idaho they have a system where they, um, all the users of boats, everyone who owns a boat or wants to put a boat into any water body within Idaho has to pay for a sticker. And that sticker raises about, I think it's $850,000 a year from the sticker program that actually funds all these inspection stations. Um, and so they, they are located on major highways coming in to Idaho and so they're requiring everybody to, uh, to be checked. An interesting thing is they do have these portable wash stations on site, yet when they talk about it, they say, well, you can kind of wash the boat with one of those portable wash stations, but to actually get rid of muscles off the boat, it takes over a day of washing everything, because, I mean, in wakeboard, wakeboard boats, they have those ballast tanks, you're trying to clean everything out from inside the ballast tanks, from inside all the motor, um, Everywhere in the boat has to be cleaned, so it's, uh, it takes a long time to do it. And it's actually at high, high temperature, high pressure water that they're using. So it's quite a good system. We're very fortunate that Idaho does have this inspection program because a lot of the traffic coming into BC actually comes up through Idaho. Um, and their biggest concern is actually from uh, a couple lakes down in Arizona that, are, that keep coming up. So that's where most of the boats they're intercepting with muscles actually are coming from Arizona. Um, here in BC, just to put that in context, we don't have any inspection stations. Um, currently, there's no laws actually preventing the introduction of mussels into our area. But fortunately, the province has been working on this since that issue in, in Shushwak Lake. Um, they have proposed changes to what's called the Alien uh, Al Controlled Alien Species Regulation which basically says you can't own lions in BC. That's kind of the idea with the controlled alien species. It's, it's dangerous animals. So what they have done is they propose to add on a number of species, including zebra and quagga mussels, into that. Uh, right now, they, were, they did some consultation in October, and last week I heard that it is on, on schedule and on target to be adopted in, in December. So by next year, we might actually have something to enforce. Um, what this says is anyone with uh, zebra and quagga mussels, they're basically not allowed live or dead in BC. So we won't be able to have our samples like this. So we have to get rid of these. But we can have them in molded plastic. So if a person, and a lot of people are buying boats out of the US, so if a person buys a boat, um, they could face up to a $50,000 fine for bringing a boat into BC that has mussels on it. But the, the issue is that you actually have to check that. Um, they can actually face up to a $250,000 fine if they introduce that introduced species into any water body in BC. So um, they're actually the rules are coming. Within that, it does allow for conservation officers to actually do inspections. And how many conservation officers do we have at the boundary? We have one. <laughs> So um, we're probably not going to see a lot of inspections. Uh, so a lot of questions came up about, you know, what about on the border? Because we have, what, uh, three border crossings within the boundary here and lots along this stretch of BC. Currently, um, border services, they can only enforce what there's laws to enforce. So it has to be a, a federal legislation. 
Um, currently, there isn't any federal legislation because Eastern Canada, they don't care. They have lots of mussels. They're not too concerned. Um, so the BC government is uh, working with the federal government to try to get um, a designation where uh, west of a certain meridian that they will, um, it becomes law to not allow the um, movement. For now, there is actually one, fortunately, with border staff, there is one clause under the Customs Act called Section 107 for, which, said, which gives them um, the ability to stop a boat if, if, if it has to do with health and safety of individuals or the environment. So they have this very vague clause that um, now that border services are aware of this issue, they can actually stop the boat and say, no, you know, there's a health issue here. Yeah, you can't bring that across. Um, pre pre provincial government is um, working to get some information together for border services because once this controlled alien species regulation is in place, they can actually enforce that coming into BC. So they are going to try to educate all our border staff um, to be watching for these things. But the challenge is that I don't know if they're going to see this little tiny muscle way inside a ballast tank. So we hope that um, it can reduce the, the risk of introduction. And I wanted to say that it's not just mussels that are potentially moving. There's a lot of other aquatic species. This is called flowering rush. It's now into um, Lake Ponderay Lake and is starting to move down the Ponderay system, which means it's going to eventually make it to Columbia. Um, so this is a species where they actually have no control and it's completely taking over um, those shallow areas within lakes and, uh, and rivers, slow moving areas of rivers. So this is something that's certainly on the watch. There's a number of other aquatic species of um, plants. And actually animals too, Brenda mentioned a few, but there's also a rusty crayfish that we're hoping doesn't get introduced. Like there's a lot of aquatics. Um, the snakehead fish being found in Burnaby Lake that Brenda mentioned earlier has actually been very beneficial to all of this. Um, because Minister Terry Lake, Minister of the Environment, actually said that there would be legislation by the end of the year to prevent this from happening again. And he's actually following through because that uh, controlled alien species regulation is on track to actually um, be in place. And that does include uh, the northern snakehead fish. But um, yeah, if you can imagine, they did catch the one fish that um, was in the lake, and it was likely an introduction for um, spiritual purposes. Um, but it's, it's a concern. I mean, these things are coming in on the black market, and as you can see, they'll eat just about anything. They'll even bite your finger if they can. Um, there is one initiative on in BC uh, around this. It's not just for zebra quagga mussels. It's a uh, clean grain dry program trying to promote um, the proper behavior to so that you're not moving things. Because there's also some fisheries diseases. Um, there's a whirling disease in fish that can potentially be moved that can really affect your uh, trout populations. So um, trying to encourage the public to uh, clean, drain, and dry their boats. So um, the Invasive Species Council of BC is the one um, implementing this program. And uh, we did actually have a, a two-person crew out at Christina Lake at two of the boat launches this summer, talking to people. And what they're doing is they were actually testing to see if they can actually change people's behavior and what works to actually get them to do something. Because a lot of times we educate people about stuff, but do they actually do anything about it? Most cases not. So they're testing to see you know, what can change people's behaviors. They collected a lot of information this year in the program, and they will be implementing a, a revised version of the program for next year. And hopefully our area will get a few of um, some of this happening here. So that's the end of the presentation. Uh, currently on Christina Lake, the question was whether there's any boat washing stations. Uh, no, there isn't currently on Christina Lake. There is, um, I know, I think Slocan Lake has installed a, um, a boat wash station or two boat, unmanned boat wash stations. Boat wash stations are a real challenge because to actually kill the muscle, you need hot water. And to do that, if you have an unmanned wash station, it's a very, people might burn themselves. So wash stations are a bit of a challenge, and you have to also make sure that you can um, maintain that wash station over time because there's a cost to it. Uh, there is some research going on in the Okanagan right now. Um, a aquatic biologist there is uh, looking into if there's one washing method that can prevent everything from mussels to the fish whirling disease to didymo, um, 
all in one method because right now they're saying different things for different species and it's really hard for people to know what to do. We won't have the results of that until next spring. So it's, we don't want to go into having wash stations right away, I think, until we know what's the most effective type of wash station to use. And then, of course, people have to actually manage to find everything on the boat. What's the temperature? You're saying hot water? What, what? I believe it's over 140 degrees. Um, for the temperature for water for, to actually kill the mussels. And it has to be over a period, I think, of five seconds or something? 40 seconds. 40 seconds, yeah. 140 degrees for 40 seconds to kill mussels. So when they're actually washing those boats from that oil wash station from the Idaho picture, they are going so slow, inch by inch, across that boat. And the thing is, too, is the boat that came across the border, sorry, oh, I don't know, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it had been decontaminated three times and still had uh, it, it still had muscles, muscles on it. They don't know if they were alive. Yeah, and they don't know if those ones were or the Belligers. Belligers. Yeah, yeah the Belligers. So the Belligers are the, the larval stage of the muscles. So they're minute little critters that swim around in the water. You have to use a microscope to see. And those can even be in standing water in any boat. So if there's any undrained water, they can survive actually fairly high temperatures. Uh, there is some information suggesting that uh, really cold winter temperatures will kill them. Um, but the work that the researcher in the South Okanagan, or the Okanagan is doing, said they're actually surviving some of those temperatures. Yeah, they're evolving and changing with, with the levels of calcium and temperature of water. <laughs> um, the other thing that I was going to mention is some of the things that we discussed at the meeting were things like boat access campgrounds and stuff like that. If you register for that, because they target snowbirds down in, I in Idaho, if that could go on your site, so when you go in to pay with your MasterCard or Visa, you have to make sure that you've been de decontaminated down yeah, in the before. States, right? Yeah. Uh, and there was a couple other things, uh, dockside marine uh, brokerages, stuff like that. They were talking about trying provincially to talk to the brokerages to get that message out that there's potentially a $50,000 fine if you bring a boat in that has these on it, so that that information gets out so that people are cleaning them long before they ever get to our border stations. Yeah. Um, something else that people can do is just, if you know people with boats or know people, your neighbor has a friend who's bringing a boat from Alberta, make sure they're aware of this because I think peer pressure amongst residents in the area saying, no, you're my neighbor, I make sure that boat's clean, this is our lake too, okay? And I think that's going to be a really important step for um, moving forward, certainly to keep it out of areas like this because we can't rely on one conservation officer doing inspections. No. And the two lakes, that, all those boats that were fouled were Lake Havasaw and Lake Mead coming out of Arizona, Nevada, California area on the Colorado River. And I think all, I can't remember how many boats in total that they found just from Lake Mead that were coming. Yeah. 122 boats that were fouled. Like, so it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Great. All right. Thank you, Barb Spear. Sounds to me like once again we're we're faced with issues of of need cold temperatures, uh, you know, for not only those but the you know the pundi as well, and and that's not happening as you can see today, a warmer day than ever. <laughs> so what we're going to do now is break for coffee, and after that, uh, we'll hear from the milfoil people and uh, Alex Stanley and Annie. So.